Okay. Hi, and welcome to Access Chat. I'm delighted that we've got Katja Engelhart with us today. Katja, uh, very pleased to have you with us. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you came to be working in the field of accessibility and, and what it is that you're doing now? Uh, yes, gladly. So um, I'm actually uh, not really working in the field of accessibility. Uh, I work for an organization uh, which is called European Schoolnet. Uh, we are based in Brussels and we are a not-for-profit not organization. Uh, and our main focus is actually uh, ICT and school education. Uh, the ministries of education, uh, around 30 of them of Europe, are our members. And uh, in the, as part of my work, we've also dealt with two projects uh, which focus indeed on uh, education of students with special needs on, and on accessibility. And so that is part of my work and uh, okay. part of the work of my organization. Okay. So, um, so these projects are pan-European projects. Um, based on, and, and so, so what, what were you investigating around the, the needs of, of students with, with, with special needs? Uh, well, maybe I first talk about the one project uh, where, yes. uh, where we've met, so to speak. That was the project ICT for IAL, and uh, the project manager of that was actually uh, the special needs agency, so not European Schoolnet. And European Schoolnet was one of the three um, organizations helping to develop these guidelines, and the aim was to develop guidelines uh, that have a specific focus on education. Um, but uh, other than that, also, uh, as other guidelines, give information and help uh, on how to make as, uh, information more accessible. And uh, if you have a look at the ICT for IAL website, you will find the guidelines in 23 languages. The project has ended uh, end of last year, so uh, it's ready and everything is available. Okay. Um. Uh, I, as, as someone who's dyslexic, I benefited greatly from being able to use assistive technologies in education. So I, I was able to, I benefited from grants to provide me with assistive tech and also the ability to use assistive technologies whilst studying and whilst uh, doing my work. How well integrated do you think uh, assistive technology tools are in education across Europe. Is, is there a common picture or do you think that there are certain countries where the integration is is further advanced than others? Um, well, I can certain, be certain that uh, that there are differences, but I'm really not an expert on the, on the topic. Uh, I can uh, highlight uh, some examples where uh, that works really well, like for example in Belgium, there's nice examples, or uh, in Denmark. But I couldn't give you a complete picture. If you if you look to the to the to the way how the different countries uh, look at digital within the classroom, uh, what you say would be the no would be the main differences in 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 relation to adopting digital technologies in 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 the way how they teach and how they manage assignments for children. Um, again, uh, it's not something I could be able to answer. But, you know, uh, you, there's, there's a, I think there's a, uh, you, you know how, how different the, the different means of education look and enable uh, ICT in school. I also don't hear you, Ross. How you do the different uh, ministries of education support and work at the level of ICT in schools. Can you give us a, a vision about how they operate at the European level, what countries are doing the best practices, and which countries are a little behind in that area? So you, uh, you're focusing on ICT in general? In ge yes. Um, well, in general, uh, if you want best practice examples, uh, then you can always be sure that uh, the Nordic countries will be mentioned, Finland, Sweden, uh, Denmark in uh, particular. Uh, also, a lot of things are going on in, in the Netherlands, but you couldn't say that, uh, that the other countries are lagging behind. Also, other big countries like Spain and Portugal have invested a lot in equipment, have a lot of teacher training going on. So... Um, but, but do you think that, you know, let's say, the investment in equipment is enough, 
or you know, or you know, in Ireland, for example, the teachers are not the most digital persons that you can find. So uh, they may have resources, but do actually they know how to use technology that they that they have available uh, through their channel, that the, through their education channels, or they still need to learn how to use technology in order to maximize all the resources that they have at their disposal. Well, that is something we say in general at European School, that it's not enough to give the equipment, but that teacher training is important. Uh, maybe trying to relate it back to our uh, topic of uh, inclusion, I can uh, talk a little bit about a workshop we had last week uh, with uh, teachers working with uh, kids with special needs. So we had experts in the room uh, working with uh, disabled children, others who are more ICT experts. And um, I think... Uh, it becomes also more important as, uh, like in Europe, also more uh, disabled children move in the mainstream classroom, which wasn't the case before. And again, there you will have a very varied picture. For example, Portugal is very advanced in that regard, Germany is lagging behind. And uh, the teachers there have te been telling me that there's a lot of things you can do, also with uh, not necessarily net assistive technology, but usual mainstream technology with online tools that don't have to be expensive. And uh, so to speak, using your own imagination. And one problem is uh, often the mindset of the teachers. A lot of uh, teachers are not ready to embrace the change. They're uh, scared of having a classroom with uh, more varied learners. So not just it's not necessarily only a problem of uh, equipment and funding, as you would think. And as much some teachers might say, but also uh, just uh, the readiness of the teachers to to. to uh, to think what they themselves uh, can also do already. And that, of course, always needs to be uh, uh, accompanied by training, of course, by experts that help. Um, and yeah. I got a lot of very nice examples of teachers who can uh, really help uh, students uh, with actually very, uh, very easy means. But so, so you touch a very important point that is related with the training of teachers. Do you think that they are having enough support for that? And you know, uh, how can, uh, is there a network, uh, is there any support at European level that t teachers can reach out in order to improve their own skills and, and, to, and, and to get that support they they, they, they train about? Mm. Well, uh, first of all, it's always uh, the ministries of education that will give you the, the support because, uh, I mean, what, for example, we at European School Net do is we can uh, also give you support, for example, via our European uh, Schoolnet Academy online courses, but that will not replace uh, training at a more local level, and uh, that also seems to be what works best if you actually get support that is uh, tailored uh, to what you do in your own school. Okay, can you tell us about in what countries uh, there's more uh, action in relation to that, to that type of, of training with teachers? Where we they show a more advance in, in the way all they are doing this at the moment. Are you still, are, are we still on the topic ICT and special needs or are you interested in, in training? General, in English and technology and classroom. Um, every country is providing training. There's very different models around that, but uh, to be honest, like I'm, I'm not really. Uh, I don't think we are really looking for comparison. Who's look, who's more advanced and who's lagging behind here? Like it's simply very different uh, how European countries uh, organize themselves. Also very simplified systems. Some of them, some of them, a lot of training is, uh, for example, Spain and Germany. A lot of training is going on on the regional level. Uh, some some would rather organize the training themselves. The ministries of education. Some other countries have a lot of private partners there. But I, at least, I wouldn't dare to say that's a matter of, uh, of uh, more advanced or not. And quite strange, and, uh, especially interest, uh, interesting topic, which maybe sometimes is more difficult to implement, is the training of uh, initial teacher training. So those that uh, haven't been in the classroom yet and are uh, learning to become teachers, uh, that seems to sometimes. Okay. okay. So I, I'm, I'm particularly interested in whether or not you've seen uh, in teacher training the inclusion of training about specific learning difficulties and, and, and how to 
um, get the most out of uh, teaching with different learning styles and so on, because that's a, an area where I think in the UK there's a recognition that that hasn't happened particularly, uh, that there was a report six years ago, I think the Rose Report was talking about how there needed to be more um, dyslexia uh, awareness training for teachers and I, I think that, that they're certainly growing up that from, from my point of view the, the lack of awareness was a, a big impediment to, to people feeling that they could achieve so do you think that there are areas of, of good practice are, are as you say the Nordic countries leading in this area as, as, as well or do you think it's it's something that that we still need to develop and share um, ways of, of, of teaching and encourage people to to learn more uh, effectively. Do you think it's a gap right now um, a, across Europe? I'm not. I'm not asking you to sort of weigh up uh, necessarily and judge the different countries, but do you think that there is still a gap in the, the sort of teaching of the, these new staff as to how to to cope with sort of hidden disabilities and specific learning difficulties in particular? Well, um, I do think there is, and I can uh, even uh, mention a report, in, uh, like the last Talis study, uh, which you might be aware of, which was published in 2013, uh, which is um, the OECD publishing it, uh, actually identified uh, teachers' uh, training needs, uh, so ask teachers which are your biggest training needs, and uh, the two things that came up uh, on the top was uh, the, uh, how to deal with uh, children with special needs and ICT. So uh, according to that study, uh, that's what teachers said they need more training on. Uh, but um, that is, uh, I also have to say, something we don't, uh, don't put on as the main focus our, of our work at the moment. Uh, for European Schoolnet. As I said, uh, we have face-to-face -face trainings on the topic, but uh, there is more potentials in that area that we could also use uh, at European level, for example, do an online op open online course on only on that topic, uh, which is something we haven't done yet, and the reason is uh, also because we need uh, funding, we need a project on that. So uh, as I can speak for my own organization, the interest is there, I think the need is there as well, but still we haven't, haven't done it ourselves. You, you tell me that you are you are currently doing online. You you are able to facilitate online training for teachers, correct? Yeah. So and that the training that you are developing, are you also uh, targeting and doing something in a way that can be used by teachers who have a special requirements in terms of accessibility? If they are not, if they could. If we are talking about blind teachers or teachers who have different requirements in in English how they interact with online training? Um, well, that uh, directly goes uh, to the question, is European School already an accessible uh, organization? And it is not. And that is something we've also uh, put uh, um, some emphasis on and uh, have tried to improve uh, our online courses in the regard that, for example, we do provide captions and transcripts and so on. But um, there's also... Uh, the difficult we find that we need uh, need to fi uh, convince our uh, platform provider also to cooperate with us. So uh, that is something we as an organization can't just change. So uh, yes, we. I personally came across a few teachers who told me uh, I have problems. Uh, I'm navigating through your platform through these online courses, and we were not able to solve the problem because we need to change the complete platform. So for the moment, we only did uh, what we can do from our end. So uh, that is something we're also uh, still looking at changing because we do think it's important, of course. I mean, that's the first step if you want to uh, help teachers in that regard that we ourselves are being accessible. Absolutely. So um, the can I say one more thing? Because I... Uh, yeah, sure. I, I'm not sure I'm... Uh, I'm giving you all the expertise you need, because as I said, we are not uh, we're not an accessibility organization, we're just an organization. First of all, uh, I mean, what our strength is that we are in close contact with the policy makers at national level, with the European Commission and with the teachers. 
in that, in that regard, we have an important role to play. Potentially, we should, we should also use more to, yeah, to uh, spread the word, so to speak. Uh, that is sort of something we're looking at now. And the second thing, uh, which is maybe more of a personal guess or observation, is that uh, I do think that the European Union or the European Commission uh, does see it as a priority. Uh, the, I mean, inclusion as such, also the inclusion of disabled children. Uh, so it's not uh, it's not something which uh, the, uh, we don't realize at European level. But uh, I I think or I have the feeling that it's also competing with other uh, priorities at the moment, uh, with uh, refugee uh, education, for example, uh, the, which is now I mean a little bit the big focus. So. That is my feeling is, a, is one of the problems we might have at the moment. Sure. So uh, I, I, there are always competing pressures for uh, resources when it comes to not just education but IP. Most projects always compete for resources in some some way, and accessibility is only one of those competitors. So under, understand that perfectly well. Um, so part of my understanding is that part of the the, the project that, that you're in, involved in, the ICT for IAL, was about finding ways to share. And you say you obviously you, you've got the the website, but how do you think you can go beyond that um, and get the sort of the message out there? Because the there are an awful, an awful lot of resources available to people on the internet, and yet people still don't find them. Do you, do you think that there's, um, how do you have well, basically how do you best communicate the the information that's that's out there because it, the internet's a, a, a big place. Are you going out and, and um, actively communicating on on these topics? Well, then we're back to the question of funding. Like we can do uh, what's possible. Like for example, mentioned any I can mention it in any uh, presentation I give also on other topic. That is an idea uh, one of our other partners had, uh, which I liked. So even if you give a presentation on uh, on something unrelated, you can uh, mention the topic of accessibility. But if you want to uh, go further, if you want to uh, like actually uh, work on the network, then you need funding. And uh, I think uh, one idea for this project was also to do national workshops to uh, train people to use it further, but uh, that is, uh, at least to my knowledge, uh, hasn't happened. So, so there are ideas, but then uh, how to, I mean, I think also good ideas how to uh, train people to use the guidelines, because as you say, rightly, you can't ex necessarily expect people to just go to your website and start using it. Just so, so, uh, so go on then. So, so if I'm, I'm a teacher in, in, in Spain, Portugal, is there a way that I can just log in on a website, upload my profile with my own details and with my areas of interest, and then share, be able to share and know the best practices with other uh, teachers in, in that same area? No. It's. I mean, you can. Uh, I invite you to have a look at the guidelines. It's, uh, oh, no, I'm, I'm. I'm having a look. Yeah, but but you don't. You don't have a forum or or a bullet a message board or anything like that. That. Uh, so 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 one of the things that, that we we've, we've enjoyed doing with with Access Chat is um is the the information sharing that we get from from the community, and um it hasn't cost us a lot of money. It's cost us time, um, but 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 we, we use social media to uh, as a way of, of getting that message out there and spreading it virally. So, uh, do you know of, of of activities like this that are taking place within the within the sort of community of research and and, and, and practice that are, are beginning to adopt? social as a low-cost means of, of promulgating information? So your question is, uh, is social media uh, means uh, to, to, you, to share so, with teachers, uh, policy makers? 
yeah, so I think is, is social media something that is considered an acceptable means? Because it, it definitely is a means to communicate. It's, it's whether or not, it's, is it something that's widely adopted and, and considered effective? Um, yes, it is widely adopted. I think in every project, European School that is involved, you will have uh, a Facebook group, you will have uh, Twitter and everything. So I think it's not anymore. I mean, there's not even the question of not doing it. Uh, it's only maybe a question of how effective it is, uh, because uh, especially when you work with the Commission, they're often content with just hearing you have a Facebook group with uh, 300, uh, 300, 3,000 members and there's been so and so many posts, but I think if you want to really uh, make a, such a group a fashion, uh, efficient also for uh, professional development and you need some sort of uh, moderation and you need... Uh, for the group to have some focus, some idea. I don't think it necessarily works. Just set it up, and uh, and that's it. Uh, that might help for just have some. I mean, here's an interesting link, and so on. But if it, uh, if you really expect some uh, deeper exchanges happening, then there needs to be some kind of uh, uh, support. I think. But I already found a, a good number of special Facebook group, groups of teachers from different countries when they collaborate in informally. On, on those groups, you know, where they talk about education in the classroom, and then you have a mesh of a group of teachers on that specific group that, for some reason, were able to find each other, and then there's another group uh, uh, that somehow does the same than that with a different group of people. So people end up doing this at the informal level. So I think it will be interesting to find out who those groups are and try to to find what people are doing and try to bring them in. Uh, uh, somehow in-house to, 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 be, to be able to create a more interesting network and, and to have people from different areas and different countries on board. So we talked about ICT for IAL and you said that you had another project that you've been working on as well. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Um, yeah, the other project we worked on uh, was called Senet, and that already finished in 2014. And uh, the main aim was to set up a network uh, that uh, supports uh, children with special needs, also those that work with them. And uh, yeah, we looked at uh, three main topics, which were like universal design for learning, which is a really interesting approach, uh, which uh, as far as I know is much more known or used in the U United States than it is in Europe. Um, the other topic was uh, the general uh, well, move of students with uh, special needs in uh, mainstream schools, which is really something which is a very different, or which has happened to a very different degree in the different European countries, and uh, the use of mobile learning uh, for students with special needs. So these were like three uh, main topics the network looked at, and in that framework we also did, uh, did uh, peer learning visits, visited countries and schools, and uh, yeah, it was a learning experience, but that is also another example of where I would say you need, uh, I mean, it doesn't continue by itself, because we have a Facebook group of that project, which has around 300 members. There are some exchanges going on, but I don't think uh, I don't think uh, it is such I mean, there could be like there could be more happening than only that Facebook group, so uh, at the moment there, uh, that network is also a bit so, but do you have identified you know, schools at the European level that work in that area? Uh, well, I know, like we've worked with some schools, so yeah. But do you have identified, uh, 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 you have a, were able to identify that network? Do you know, you know how, many, how many schools are working in that space, for example, in Spain, in Portugal? Do you are able to somehow to identify them? and know who are, who are the people leading those schools? Well, we worked with some of the schools and we got a general picture of uh, how it is organized in different countries. But you don't have a list of those schools that could be provided by the ministers of education in order to find ways to reach them out? No. I think that is, uh, I mean, that is an exercise uh, for the ministries to do. Okay, but, you know, but for what we're able to see is, we, we work in, the, in different areas of technology and digital, 
and something that is very clear for us, uh, even in the way how people consume digital is all countries have, are at different uh, steps of adopting digital and not only at this level but also at a commercial level and we found out there's somehow a kind of correlation in the way how people use technology on their own private lives and the way how they use technology at work and we found that so sometimes some countries you, do, you won't see a level of proactivity because in fact people in working in that area themselves they are not that type of digital consumers yet they don't have digital as part of their lives for some reason on the other so it could be interesting to see how the at a, at a commission level that could actually uh, be some action in order to facilitate that connection from a central point to a more local point so you want to have an overview of how digitally competent uh, teachers are no, not that i think it will be it will be interesting to to you know from from the European, at the European Union level to act as the hub uh, of all this kind of network. It will be the, the starting point of everything. So but that's why it will be interesting to have access to information about how many schools in Europe are working are working on that specific sector. And then instead of waiting for the Ministry of Education to contact them, allow them to have a more direct contact with the project and with the network. I think it will be a, a more interesting way to, to, to enable a network at this level. Well, I, I guess uh, there's two things here. I mean, the first thing is that indeed is a priority also at the European level or at the central level to have the information in the first place on, on how much equipment you have in each school, how digitally competent teachers are. Um, and the second thing is a network. That's really something uh, different already. And on the first point, I can say that European Schoolnet has actually um, carried out a big survey on that because that is indeed, uh, I mean, important to know, to even have an overview. And uh, that uh, survey has been published in 2013, so it's already a few years ago. And now, uh, like, the European Commission is looking into that. And uh, it's really difficult to get the information at the European level. It's not, uh, it's not as easy because you... Uh, we've been doing it the last time, and uh, I mean, the, it's really difficult to get the schools to uh, to reply to a questionnaire because that's what you need uh, to do. I mean, otherwise, how do you get the information? So there is uh, the need for that, but it's it's really not uh, so easy to put it uh, to put in place. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I've got a, a question. You um, you talked about different ways of learning and so on. And different uh, approaches to uh, technology. We've talked about that a couple of times, but uh, mobile in particular. How do you see um, adoption of mobile? I, I spent a long time, about seven or eight years ago, before I came into this current job, working uh, in the education sector um, with mobiles. And at that point, there was quite a lot of resistance to smartphones in the classroom. Do you still see that resistance or do you think that as mobile adoption and use within life in general has become more ubiquitous that the, the resistance is, is decreasing? Mm. Well, first I can say that we uh, also had a project on, on tablets in particular, which was a big trend in education. It has almost changed a bit already. And um, that we do see, I mean, it has been around for a couple of years, the idea that uh, mobile learning uh, can change the learning, smartphones, tablets, and so on. So uh, the potential is there, but uh, there is the issue is still there that at some schools you find the teachers say uh, you can't use your smartphone or your tablet. So uh, it's interesting, but I don't think that, uh, that uh, the, resist the resistance has completely disappeared. That's still very depends from school to school and uh, sometimes even uh, from teacher to teacher. No, don't think this somehow creates a sort of inequality in relation to how uh, kids learn and how they experience all that, in, in, considering that uh, the jobs of the future are becoming more and more digital. So if, when kids don't have that type of experience, you are somehow uh, leaving them behind in terms of the way how they use technology. And, well, that is uh, probably something uh, European Schoolnet would say as well that, uh, like, in, you need to uh, 
teach children uh, how to use technology today because it will they will need it for their future jobs, but also because there are several ways of how ICT can uh, improve the learning experience as such. Mobile learning is one of those examples which can help you to personalize this learning, to have more um, collaborative learning, to go more outside of the classroom, all these things. But what we also uh, saw in our CCL project on tablets is that a lot of time, I mean, there is a lot of potential and still teachers tend to use a lot of the ICT uh, in very traditional ways. So uh, the potential for what it could be used for is, is often not used. Do you know that Ian Cork, a few years ago, uh, they started a movement called Code Dojo? Yes. And this movement somehow is an informal way of teaching kids how to code and using technology. And they were informally, they were able to reach most of the schools in Ireland to organize informal events uh, you know, or at the end of the day or sometimes over the weekend, where teach, teachers and people from outside the school are able to support the kids uh, learning code and, and sometimes just having a conversation about how, how to create a website. So uh, this movement was able to reach several, several European countries. So. How important you see uh, in movements, informal move, movements like this, uh, in the in educational practices? Well, uh, coding uh, is something European Schoolnet has also been working on. We published a report uh, trying to see what's going on in Europe the last few years. Uh, and now, at the moment, we're working on a report or a study on the computational thinking, which goes even beyond uh, programming. So. Uh, from all what I know, these informal movements are incredibly important, uh, give a lot of energy to what is happening. But if you're talking about uh, equal access to the opportunity, then, then it needs to be in the formal education. Because uh, with the informal opportunities, you're most likely going to reach those that are anyways interested or whose parents put them there or whatever. So if you, if you want to ensure that also those who don't think of themselves as being interested in technology, maybe also girls and so on, should also get the opportunity, then it should be uh, also taught at school. And uh, like as I said, we are preparing that study at the moment on computational thinking. And what I found really interesting uh, also in that workshop last week, I talked to a teacher who was uh, teaching programming also to her children with uh, special needs. And uh, she said uh, uh, that some of the children, like especially some autistic children, are actually really good at, uh, at programming. That is something which I found very interesting and also uh, worthwhile highlighting. Um. So I, I think we've reached the end of our, our half hour. So um, thank you very much for you know, allowing us to put you through the through the, the questioning. Um, look forward to joining you on Twitter tomorrow night. So. Um, did you more or less get the answers you needed? Because I, I'm very unsure, like, uh, no, we, we, what we, 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 will, we will just uh, we'll talk about that. We will, we will uh, close the recording for now. Uh, okay. th thank you so much, and we Thanks. will uh, see you on Twitter.